Please rise as you are able and join me in the invitation together. From the north and the south, the east and the west we come. We come for connection and community, for inspiration and enlightenment. We come seeking oneness with the divine, with the earth, and with one another. <clears throat> o Creator, in this holy time and sacred space, we bring all of ourselves. We long to be seen and known and understood. May we also seek to see, to know, and to understand. We are much like the stones which make up the bed of a river. As a whole, we hold up and support the water of the river in its, as it flows to its destination. As a people, we celebrate all that unites us and our common purpose. Yet not every cobble which makes up a riverbed is the same. Carved into a multitude of shapes, sizes, and colors, each one is different, yet each is shaped from the same water. Teach us also to celebrate that which makes us unique, the distinctive identities which form us, the joys which sustain us, and the pains which challenge us. Remind us that unity is not uniformity. It is not sameness, it is not conformity. Let us be mindful that we are river stones who are equally shaped by the river of our world, yet we collectively shape and create the path of that river itself. They support and guide the river from its headwaters to its destination, both in balance. Unity is that which drives us to seek the common good for all, no matter what. It is in this spirit that you welcome us in. It is in the same spirit that you will send us forth once more, stones of your river of creation. Amen. Please be seated. See 
Good morning. morning. Welcome to New England Congregational Church and a very special welcome to those who are guests with us. We hope you find our hospitality truly warm and your experience of worship truly meaningful. No matter who you are or where you are on your journey of life or faith, you are welcome here. Please note your attendance in the friendship register before passing it to your neighbor. A special thank you to our musicians, to Marsha and Margaret, Jan and Jim, to John, our liturgist, to our greeters and ushers, and to Pat in the AV booth. We're so grateful for your participation. Please take a moment this morning to read through all of the announcements in your bulletin. Of special note, next Sunday will be a wonderfully full and rich day indeed. It's Reformation Sunday. We'll be kicking off our fall stewardship drive, and it's also Halloween. Special programs are planned for our children during church school, and all are invited to wear costumes to worship. Following the service, we'll move to the parking lot for our very first trunk or treat. It's still not too late to sign up to make your trunk one of the stops. Prizes will be awarded for the best adult costume, and the best decked trunk. We hope you'll join the celebration and help provide a safe and welcoming place for our kids to trick or treat. You can sign up in the marketplace or by using the link in this morning's e-blast. And now, let us continue in worship with our ministry of music.
Our children are invited forward. good to see all of you this morning. Who loves that it's raining outside today? Okay. You like to play inside. Well, I'm glad to hear that we've got some folks who like the rain. That's good. And it's nice because we don't have any other choice. <laughs> this morning, I have a story to tell you. And then we're going to have a little conversation. This story is going to require some listening because there's going to be some clues throughout the story, and you're going to have to guess what the clues are describing. Okay? A very young mouse who had never seen anything of the world almost didn't make it home again after the very first time she ventured out. And this is the story that she told her mother about her adventures. I was strolling along very peaceably, when just as I turned the corner into the next yard, I saw two creatures. One of them had a very kind and gracious look, but the other was the most fearful monster you can imagine. You should have seen him. On top of his head and in front of his neck hung pieces of raw red meat. He walked about tirelessly, tearing up the ground with his toes and beating his arms savagely against his sides. The moment he caught sight of me, he opened up his pointed mouth as if to swallow me, and then he let out a piercing roar that frightened me almost to death. Can you guess who it was that our young mouse was trying to describe to her mother? A lion. A turkey. A lion. A tiger. A dog. All right. It was nobody but the barnyard rooster. <laughs> and it was the first rooster that the little mouse had ever seen. If it had not been for that terrible monster, the mouse went on, I would have made the acquaintance of the very pretty creature who looked so good and gentle. She had thick, velvety fur, a meek face, and a look that was very modest, though her eyes were bright and shining. As she looked at me, she waved his, her fine, long tail and smiled. Who do you think the pretty creature was? A horse? Uh huh. You think it was a cat? A unicorn? A duck? A fat cat? A peacock? A dog? Those are all really good guesses. Really good guesses. I'm sure she was about to speak to me, said the little mouse, when the monster I told you about let out a screaming yell and I ran for my life. My son, said the mother mouse, that gentle creature you saw was none other than the cat. Under her kindly appearance, she bears a grudge against every one of us. The other was nothing but a bird who wouldn't harm you in the least. As for the cat, she eats us. So be thankful, my child, that you escaped with your life, and as long as you live, never judge people by their looks. Never judge people by their looks. That's a really good lesson, isn't it? Has anyone ever heard that before? 
yeah. Maybe a parent or a teacher has said that to you. It's a really good lesson for kids and for adults. This week, let's try not to judge others based on their looks. Let's get to know them first. Better yet, let's try not to judge at all. Will you share a prayer with me? Dear God, thank you for making each of us look different on the outside. All of us are special on the outside and on the inside, and all of us are loved by you. Help us not judge people by their looks. Amen. Thank you all for coming. You can head to church school. Let us gather our hearts and our spirits for a time of prayer. O oh God, we see in our world a host of challenges, and many who lack the creativity or the conscience to rise to meet them. But you call us to a different way. In the noise of voices calling for revenge and restitution, for judgment and punishment, we pray for the courage to speak out for restoration when pain, poverty, and persecution leave people blind to grace and compassion, we pray for the courage to carry the light of love and forgiveness. Where the quest to even the score has left our world angry and wounded, we pray for the courage to release our grievances and seek wholeness for all. May our living be our prayer. And may we be guided by hope toward your dream of healing and wholeness for all, even as Jesus was who taught us to pray, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. reading now from the Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter. They came to Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. Here ends the reading. In January of 1933, the Atlantic Monthly ran an article entitled Three Days to See, which was written by none other than Helen Keller, the famed deaf-blind American author, political activist, and lecturer. In Three Days to See, Keller states that most people take life and their senses for granted. She imagines how she would use her eyes if she were to be given three days of sight. On the first day, Keller writes, she would want to see the people dearest to her, calling them close and looking long into their faces, imprinting upon her mind the outward evidence of the beauty within. She would want to look into the face of a baby, the eyes of her dogs, to view the small and simple things of her home, to walk in the woods and intoxicate her eyes on the beauties of the world of nature, to see a sunset. On the second day, Keller would arise at dawn to see, as she says, the thrilling miracle by which night is transformed into dawn. She would see museums and the theater or movies. On the third day, she would see her city, New York, her suburban neighborhood, the bridge and the river, the city center and the view from the Empire State Building, Fifth Avenue, then the slums, the factories, the parks, before going to the theater to see a hilariously funny play. Three days, storing up memories for the long night ahead. If we were faced with the same challenge, she writes, then at last you would really see and a new world of beauty would open itself before you. Is it any wonder that like Keller, Bartimaeus wanted to see. Mark's story of the healing of a blind man is a wonderful story indeed. It's Helen Keller's dream come true, but not just for three days, for a lifetime. This is the kind of story that we love to hear on Sunday mornings, or any time really, because it has a happy ending, and if blind old Bart could have a happy ending, maybe we can too. There is, however, much more to this story. As you will remember, last week's gospel lesson told of Jesus' friends arguing who would receive the places of greatest honor in his coming kingdom. Despite predicting his own fast approaching passion and death, Jesus' friends still believed that he would overthrow the oppression of Rome and rule Israel like their ancestor, King David. They had been on the road with Jesus for nearly three years. They had seen him heal with their eyes. They had heard him preach and teach with their ears. And yet after all this time, they still didn't really know him, didn't really see him. Bartimaeus, on the other hand, 
though blind, immediately recognized Jesus and called him son of David, an allusion to Jesus' messianic purpose and an, an explicit link to David's city, Jerusalem, where Jesus would soon be tried and executed. In contrast to Jesus' friends, Bartimaeus was the embodiment of the perfect disciple, one who not only saw Jesus, but knew him, understood his purpose, was called by Jesus, healed by faith, and then who followed without fear. Bartimaeus was blind, but he saw Jesus for who he really was. Now, before we're too quick to judge the disciples, though, I wonder how often we see things, see people, without really registering and processing who or what we're seeing. Who and what do we miss? The crowd around Bartimaeus that day were really the blind ones. Day in and day out, he sat by the road, begging for coins from passers-by. He was mostly ignored, occasionally reproached, and rarely pitied with a shekel or two. But he was never comforted. He was never befriended. He was never welcomed into community. When a famed teacher and healer strode into town, the crowd was quick to shush the pesky blind man, to remind him of his place, to shut him up and sit him down so that they could go on ignoring him. Not Jesus, though. Jesus saw Bartimaeus just as Bartimaeus saw Jesus, called him over and asked him what he wanted from him. Jesus acknowledged him, gave him back his voice, gave him back his humanity, and then gave him back his physical sight. If I'm honest with you, I think that this is much more than a healing story, and I really don't think it has much to do with physical sight at all. This story is a reminder that there is much, much more to sight than just eyes. In the tale, A Scandal in Bohemia, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's famous character, Sherlock Holmes, explores this nuance with his partner, Dr. Watson. You see, but you do not observe, says Holmes to Watson. The distinction is clear. For example, you have frequently seen the steps which lead up from the hall to this room. Frequently, agreed Watson. How often? Well, some hundreds of times. Then how many are there? How many? I don't know. Quite so, exclaimed Holmes. You have not observed and yet you have seen. That is just my point. Now I know that there are 17 steps because I have both seen and observed. And so I wonder how often we see things, see people without really observing them, as Holmes says. Who and what do we miss? Bartimaeus' eyes, his sight, really isn't the point of this story, but ours is, though. This story is meant to open our eyes, not just the physical eyes in our eye sockets, but also the full comprehension of our minds and the power of our senses. This story is meant to send us, you and me, forth truly seeing. I wonder who and what have we been missing? Last week, in a beautiful and deeply meaningful way, this congregation, you, 
let the Reverend Gary McCann know that he'd been truly seen. With speeches, gifts, decorations, special music, and a lovely meal, you celebrated his 35 years with you as minister. Better than the accolades, party, and gifts, the very best gift you gave him was the knowledge that he had been seen and known by you. Now, I have a feeling that Gary already knew that, but it's always good to be reminded. It feels good to be truly seen. Helen Keller offers this exhortation to the sighted. I who am blind can give one hint to those who see, one admonition to those who would make full use of the gift of sight. Use your eyes as if tomorrow you would be stricken blind. And use the same method with the other senses. Hear the music of voices, the song of a bird, the mighty strains of an orchestra, as if you would be stricken deaf tomorrow. Touch an object you want to touch, as if tomorrow your tactile senses would fail. Smell the perfume of flowers. Taste with relish each morsel, as if tomorrow you could never smell and taste again. Make the most of every sense. Glory in all the facets of pleasure and beauty which the world reveals to you through the several means of contact which nature provides, but of all the senses. I am sure that sight must be the most delightful. This morning, let us pray with Bartimaeus, O oh God, let us see. Amen.
In faith, we dedicate these gifts to Jesus' work, to bring healing and wholeness, compassion and peace. May this work be our calling too, until suffering is ended, the earth is healed, and all peoples are truly one. Amen. Please be seated. Dear friends, we receive fragments of holiness, glimpses of eternity, brief moments of insight. Let us gather them up for the precious gifts that they are, and renewed by their grace, move boldly into the unknown. Go in peace, for you cannot go where God is not. Amen. 